Hours and just once you react on this is America's new tank is legitimately insane by channel task and purpose. Yes, another task and purpose video about M1A3 or was it A4? No, I didn't say the thumbnail. Yeah, so I'm guessing this is just another version of like Abrams. So, how is that a new tank? Wouldn't that be just like a new version or they change it so much it might as well be a new tank? Because America and like generally like this is how a modern thing is making things seamless. So one thing that does all the job or like everything kind of looks the same, right? I think American military started doing that. Somebody just basically went there like, what if we make everything kind of look the same, keep the same, but does the multiple job. That's why after if I was created and all that shit and everywhere you see around the world, even the basically cars, cars manufacture and things like that, right? They always take inspiration from things like this. So even in cars, when you see like a small hatchback, it will be some version of like the big SUV they have. It will look exactly the same. It's like you want the small one, you want the big one. There is no difference. That's how it's becoming slowly, right? So I'm guessing it's like that. Like it's still Abrams, but like it's completely different type of way. Or maybe they just improved it so much. It might as well be new time. Who knows? But it's going to be interesting. Let's watch it. The U.S. Army's next-generation M1E3 Abrams main battle tank is legitimately insane. In the best way possible, I dug up this list of proposed capabilities for the new design that include an autoloader, new main gun, new turret, hypersonic gun-launched missiles that maneuver in mid-air, the ability to pair with robots, masking capabilities to reduce thermal and electromagnetic signatures, AI systems that detect incoming fire and prioritize return fire, hybrid electric drivetrain, reduction of crew from four to three, reduction of weight from 75 tons down to sub 60 tons. But the coolest thing is it'll likely get a brand new sleek hull for the first time in 30 years. Now you know where all the rumors come from that I'm secretly attracted to main battle tanks. What we're witnessing, I think, is U.S. Army leadership reversing course on decades of tank design philosophy to do a last minute complete overhaul from the ground up based on new lessons learned from the war in Ukraine. In this episode, we're going to explore how these changes might affect the future of tank warfare, what new tactics the M1E3 Abrams will allow for, and will people ever stop saying that tanks are obsolete? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Hit the like and subscribe button and let's find out. But first, this video is only possible thanks to our sponsor, Policy Genius Life Insurance, a one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need at the right price. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It saves you time and money. So yeah, one thing's for damn sure, right? Like, them, they were like keeping keen eye on the Ukraine war, especially when they, now they have Abrams, like how Abrams going to perform there. What is his shortcomings and things? So the next version is going to be really insane, right? People are, keep saying that China, right? China with this, all this insane tech, but like, is that going to work? There's a question mark there because they've never been in any kind of war at all. Or they've never given their equipment to somebody who's at war type of way. Maybe they might do to, with Russia, like, okay, let's give you the equipment, see what happens. Oh, I don't know. But that, that, that might piss off USA, so they're not going to do that. So USA, basically, with all the different wars, Gulf War, this war, Afghanistan War, Iraq Wars, all these type of different wars, and now Ukraine War. They always have this kind of like a real world trial and error type of way, right? So they can really, you know, see where the problems are and can literally improve it. And I'm sure they're going to like take a lot of things from the Abram X as well. Right. I mean, they made the prototype, might as well utilize the technology type of way. I don't know. Yeah, well, go to policygenius.com for us, task and purpose and support this channel. Click the link in the description to compare free life insurance quotes from top companies and see how much you could save today. Let's first start with the things that go boom. The new M1E3 has some serious firepower upgrades proposed for it, the most surprising of which I think is a recommendation that has the potential development of a gun-launched anti-tank guided missile. Russian Eastern tanks do not. Why is that? There are a number of reasons. One is that some Soviet tank cannons weren't able to get long enough range and accuracy compared to their NATO counterparts. Soviet tank designers wanted to be able to hit helicopters at long ranges too with these missiles. And the United States did develop two separate tank launch missiles but they canceled the first one in the 1990s. The reason for this is because sensors at the time couldn't accurately identify targets out past five kilometers range. It was also canceled because of some offensive tweets it made about Chinese tanks years ago. However, I was shocked to learn that in one test, a US Abrams fired a prototype missile from the cannon and hit a moving T-72 tank at a range of 8,600 meters. 
We're talking, of course, about the XM943 tank round, or the smart target activated fire and forget staff. But the Army never invested in it to go full rate production. Part of the reason for this might be because it's also true that tank launched ATGMs have a smaller warhead and they don't perform as well against modern composite armor compared to the 1970s. So why are they resurrecting this retro program? Take a look at this U.S. Army terrain analysis real quick. Army engineers went out into the field in Latvia and Lithuania. They used laser range finders to test how many points tanks would be able to fire five kilometers with a line of sight to a target. You're looking at the red circles of 25 different points that are scattered throughout Latvia and Lithuania border that they tested. The results were that there were actually numerous locations suitable for that long five kilometer range engagement that might make use of a tank fired ATGM. However, training on tank fired guided missiles would be difficult. That's why I'm advocating that the US Army invest in these training rigs for our future warriors. Do it for the sake of our future warriors. Who? Glenn Giorno, former 19 kilo M1 armor crewman at the US Army, who was involved in the development of that anti-tank guided missile round, said, quote, we could not find a way to implement and identify friendly or foe system that could not be exploited by a near peer adversary. The projectile didn't care if you were a tank or an ambulance. Money was instead invested in making higher resolution thermal sites for the M1A2, which can now have a 50x thermal site. I even acquired some footage of one of those new anti-tank munitions being loaded up. Energy drinks are now mandatory, standard issue kit for every American M1A3 tank crew. This suggests to us that new technologies developed since then and higher quality thermal optics could make cannon launched missiles worth exploring again for the M1A3. However, the new XM360 cannon and its- I mean, uh, that is one of the reasons, like, America is always like looking for technology, but they basically listen to people on the field. Right? They don't do technology for the sake of technology. Sometimes it's like, is this going to work seamlessly on the battlefield? If the answer is no, they're probably not going to do it. That's why the, there's no auto-loading and shit like that, because they see like there might be a problem here. Right? So I kind of see where the point is. But yeah, with the newer, newer technology, especially past five years, where it's like precision technology is becoming really, really precise. I can see where, how they're like, okay, let's try it again type of way. And nowadays, like, uh, you know, how they basically... Uh, destroyed uh, carrier, you know, aircraft carrier type uh, boat with a B2 bomber type of precise shit, right? That is really precise bomb. Like, they're, they're targeting uh, technology is getting better. So they're like, who knows? Let's try that one. Makes sense. Ammo could keep tank fired ATGMs unnecessary for Western tanks. The gun actually has the same bore diameter of 120 millimeters that the M256 currently has equipped on the Abrams. But the new one uses composite barrel construction. It uses electrothermal chemical ignition to lower weight by a full ton while still adding punch. It's still in the experimental stage, but using ETC technology, a similar 120 millimeter gun projectile was tested in 1990 and it had up to 17 megajoules of muzzle energy. Stop, I can only hoo us so hard, you guys. That's like the same amount of energy as a full speed car crash to the teeth. It's about what a conventionally powered 140 millimeter cannon could produce. Fellas, is my fixation on 120 mm smoothbore cannons normal? The current Abrams gun goes up to about 15 megajoules of muzzle energy. The way it works is it involves using an electric current to generate plasma, which then ignites the chemical propellant behind a projectile. This method allows for more precise control of the ignition process, resulting in higher velocities and improved accuracy and range for projectiles. It's like supercharging the way a gun fires its ammo. Look, man, even Abrams is going electric. Isn't that something? There you go. Reminds me of like the hybrid 6.8mm ammo on the XM7 rifle. To ensure victory, the employment of a mass of tanks in a decisive direction with overwhelming firepower is essential. These three gentlemen you see here are the United States military's top decision makers responsible for the new Abrams. Their Brigadier General Joffrey Norman, the seasoned combat veteran of the crew, Major General Glenn Dean, the aerospace engineer, and Colonel Thompson, the strict yet fair Deputy Director of Soldier Lethality Cross-Functional Teams. Now, they're the A-team of American tank design, with decades of experience between them, and seeing them work makes me want to say hula in the most unironic way. 
Should have put like Ocean's Eleven style music in the background when he was doing all those graphics. Working with them is a team of technicians in Eastern Europe who are in direct contact with Ukrainian tank crews to learn insights on how the Abrams is performing in high intensity warfare. These insights then inform the direction of development. General Norman said, quote, we appreciate the future battlefields pose new challenges to the tank as we study recent and ongoing conflicts, end quote. Because the stakes are high here, right? The open source intelligence website Oryx claims that 14 of the 31 Abrams tanks have been knocked out so far. This ultimately led to them being pulled from the front lines because of a number of reasons, including that they were too vulnerable to air attack and too heavy. They were reworked and sent back into the fight since then. And I know it's not a one to one comparison, but I think it does reveal some of the vulnerabilities of the old M1A1 Abrams that we're going to be seeing addressed here with this new model. According to General Norman, we anticipate having to change the crew configuration, potentially looking at opportunities to go to a remote turret or an optionally manned turret. OK, Abrams might be <laughs> the one tank that like first A1 versus whatever E3, A4 now they're doing would be so different than each other. It's like, what the hell? How is this even a same tank, right? Usually when that type of weapon, people usually change the model number completely. So they're like, oh, this is a completely different tank. Not really. That looks like the that older version. Yeah, but it's like improved. The Americans don't know this. It's still, a, a, you know, M1 Abrams. It's like your grandfather probably you know, served in it. You're going to probably serve in it as well, but it's completely different. It's still Abrams. In order to save space under armor. So they're going to link the new cannon to a remote controlled, optionally manned turret. By switching to an autoloader and making the turret interior smaller, that's a lot less volume that has to be protected by heavy armor, which equates to a lot less tons of armor. Chat, what do you guys think of that? So interestingly, the new cannon wouldn't be manually loaded. It would be fed by an autoloader, like a machine that automatically loads the new rounds up next. That doesn't mean that its ammo would explode like the T-72 series of autoloaded tanks, though. Newly designed autoloading tanks can have all of their ammo secured behind a bulkhead blast shield and can work with blowout panels to prevent detonation from cooking the crew. It depends on how they choose to design it. If all or most of the crew are in a separate compartment down in the hole, the turret itself could act as a barrier between the crew and the ammo. We've also seen from combat yeah, there's a difference between f democratic free country versus like, I guess, communist one. Because I don't really see like something like China or something, right? Okay, uh, you know, why would we create that technology if the ammo explodes, tank is lost anyway? Uh, what about the soldiers? What about the soldiers? <laughs> That's what the question, question would be. And that doesn't feel far-fetched because since all the new <laughs> Chinese tank we've seen, they every time they inconveniently place you know place like uh, exit doors and things like that where there is an issue like uh, you know where the shells eject or some shit like that like ah soldiers gonna be fine who cares that in ukraine that the abrams engine deck with its air intakes and radiators is a popular target point for drone swarms so the army is looking at unique ways to keep the engine better protected from above without sacrificing cooling performance the new m1e3 abrams tank would also upgrade from that puny 50 caliber machine gun to possibly the 30 millimeter chain gun remote weapon station. The big advantage there is that it could fire specially made 30 mic mics that provide air organic to the vehicle air defense. That firepower increase makes the hairs on my cock broom stand at attention. I heard all the good 19 kilos have nice mustaches. The tank, like the airplane, may be said to be the answer to the prayers of the modern infantrymen. One of the most important things you need to know about new tanks is that in the past, when the army decided to upgrade a tank, they didn't design a whole new tank hole from scratch. Instead, they took an existing one from the roughly 2,500 already in service and then modified it, or they would grab from one of the 3,700 retired husks collecting dust and storage. Many of those are located in California in the desert, out in the middle of nowhere at the Sierra Army Depot. The old Abrams is then transported by rail to a facility to have a complete makeover, being refurbished and upgraded. Are you that is an insane distance. Damn. <laughs> no, what is that, like 2,000 miles plus or something? Two, 3,000 miles? Because that's a big patch, right? Like, that's like jumping, I guess, three time zones. That, yeah, probably. 
tired of your old clunky main battle tank? It's time to upgrade your ride. Introducing the M1A2 SEP V3 Abrams, because why park when you can create your own parking lot? Every decade, the Army rolls out a new systems enhancement package. So come on down and settle for one of our refurbished year 2000 SEP V1, or how about a 2010 V2, or even a 2020 SEP V3 Abrams. We've gutted the old beasts and replaced everything. Communications, GPS, thermal imaging, fire control, you name it, we got it. We kept the classic hull and turret that you've known to love about the Abrams because it's the opposite of planned obsolescence, it's maximum efficiency. Also, it saves you millions of dollars. Yeah, it costs $24 million each, but no one can get mad at you for buying it because now you have a fucking tank. We have to remember that systems enhancement packages was always supposed to be a stop. That family episode, like, I'm pretty sure it's like one of the early ones where Peter's like, sweet, I can buy a tank. He just takes a tank and bullies everyone. I'm pretty sure Meg and everyone. That's insane. I'm basically remembering that every time he says that. Can you really buy a tank for, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure like, you know, Top Gear made a, was it Grand Tour? Top, yeah, Top Gear made an episode about like how you can just buy a like old military. Of course, they're, they're not going to have active guns and things. But can you really buy a tank without active guns? Which I'm pretty sure, like, knowing Americans, they can basically take the shed and just, like, activate it or some shit. I'm pretty sure that would be majorly criminal, but still. Gap temporary band-aid solution for the Abrams. Because the service thought that they would do with that until a full replacement vehicle was chosen. That's how we ended up with, like, a dozen different variants of Abrams tanks with various levels of advanced features. In the early 2000s, the XM-1202 mounted combat system was supposed to replace all the Abrams, but funding for the program was cut in 2009, a trend that would continue because starting in 2013, the public and army leadership started to question why we even had tanks in the first place. I mean, they're pretty damn expensive and you rarely need them in a fight against enemy insurgents. So in 2013, the military closed their M1 Abrams factory in Ohio to save $1 billion. The problem is, we lost hundreds of skilled tank engineers, and it cost a ton to get the assembly line back in action. But the factory was reopened in 2017, with funding that breathed new life into the Abrams tank development. The cost to upgrade 165 Abrams to the SEP V3 is around $1.75 billion. That's actually relatively cheap in defense dollars by not requiring brand new holes or turrets to be fabricated. The main difference between the M1, A1, and A2 is its electronics. Yeah, imagine like Elon Musk and like all those people flexing in their like hundreds of billions. We are hundreds of billions and like <laughs> American DOD basically just like spending two, three hundred billion. Like yeah, nothing basically. We, we get 800 billion every year just to spend on military. There you go. So yeah, a few billion, you know, one billion, two billion, what are you, what are you, cheap? <laughs> Basically, that's cheap talk in military terms. However, with this new M1A3, it's now likely to have a whole brand new hull and turret. There's conflicting reports on that, but I can't see any other way that we get the kind of weight reductions that they're looking for without a whole new hull with different types of composite armor. That's part of the reason why the M1A3 is so big of a deal. Is it just me, or does that new hull look really good? That is, oof, that is one nice looking hull. This better not awaken anything in me. In 2023, the army shocked the entire defense world when they decided to cancel plans for the system enhancement package version four. The first version of the Abrams tank weighed 54 tons. SEP V4 that was canceled was on track to weigh over 75 tons add in a mine plow, and it was gonna break the scales at 83 tons. The M1A3 that we're talking about is gonna try to be under 60 tons for reasons that we'll get into. But how do you make a multi-billion dollar decision like that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure like the latest one, they, what is it, A2, A3, whatever, right? Was 75 tons, right? The modern one the US has right before this one, right? 70, 75, something like that. So yeah, 60 tons is like a lot of, that's like, that's light. Sports car light. A choice that will affect thousands of soldiers, a decision that will ultimately decide whether future warriors will have the best equipment or not. The defense industry can be an opaque bureaucratic nightmare. The inner workings and the bowels of defense procurement can be a mystery, even for those who work in it. But in this case, I think it's important to understand that. 
According to a congressional research report, it was an Army Science Board study from 2019 that convinced these three key decision makers that we mentioned in the beginning of the video to develop the brand new M1E3. And what is the Army Science Board? It provides the military with world-class scientists, engineers, business and policy experts from the private sector and academia. That quiet engineering professor you had at Sarah Lawrence is moonlighting as a consultant for the Army, helping obliterate people halfway around the world. In May 2024, yeah, I think the biggest one I think happened during the Oppenheimer time, right? This is when like military realized, wait, I mean, these geeks are important type of shit. And since then, they've always been part of it, right? There's always like physicists in one room, military strategists in another room in the same building, ba basically having lunch together, doing this like back and forth type of thing. That's why you see insane tech getting introduced to military first, because they're literally taking that from, you know, frontier scientists who are basically... Uh, figure shit out come up with it then there are engineers and there you go put it in the military everybody else get later type of way that's what darpa creates a lot of shit they're like when military uses it five ten years later like everyday use starts in america and then even five years later entire world gets some shit like that for the first contract for a preliminary design went out to general dynamics land systems based on the requirements from the army science board the over 200 consultants have been in the background and unseen. There are rarely heard influence guiding U.S. Army procurement. They wield considerable power and are responsible for some of the most effective weapon systems since the Korean War. I went to the Army Science Board website to see if I could dig up any information on that report. I thought there's absolutely no way that this information is easily searchable for an idiot like myself. And yet there it was, all easily searchable. Quote, the M1A2 SEPT. Yeah, I think <laughs> War Thunder, after War Thunder forums, like everybody knows, like it's probably much easier to find some shit. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous how accessible things are. I'm not going to lie, like it literally surprises me a lot of time. Like you, you're not supposed to know these things. Uh, there are certain like experts or like ex-military guys who just come out in open and like, you know, news media. Am I going to get trouble in saying this? It basically says it, right? Sometimes they get in trouble, but most time it's just like fine. Like nobody cares. I think even military have accepted. Like we live in information, uh, you know, information technology world basically, where everybody gets. There is no way in hell you can keep anything secret anymore. And so military move forward thinking like what I'm doing right now. Even if people find it, doesn't matter in that way. Like secrecy is not that important type of way. They're they're molding the technology around it. Like who cares if somebody figure out we are doing this? Like they're not gonna like suddenly know the technology right people know we have like you know like fifth generation stealth all right so what unless you capture one of our planes you're not going to know how the technology works so i think that's how like military is moving forward like i don't care if people knows about it like that's it's not gonna matter three and four upgrades will improve effectiveness but not restore dominance near transparency in all domains will significantly increase the lethality our forces will experience we will continue to have to fight outnumbered exacerbated by a low mbt operational readiness rate and aging fleet so the science board study influenced senior army leadership to go in a new direction recommending a 2.9 billion dollar seven and a half year long program to develop a whole new tank if you skim through the document i think it's really interesting to note that they believe their main competition was the russian t-14 back in 2019 which they mentioned 14 times throughout the document some of the most influential people in the u.s army weapons development r d teams thought that the russian t-14 tank was a potential real threat and we're developing these insane new systems to counter its claimed abilities. The Army Science Board also recommended a whole new chassis in the documents. General Glenn Dean said, quote, the Abrams tank can no longer grow its capabilities without adding weight, and we need to... Yeah, I think with the T-14, like the current of war basically got in the way, and like every time I hear anybody talk about T-14, even like uh, people who doesn't like Russia, even they admit usually like, I'm not so convinced on T14 only because I don't see much. Like, where are they? There's no production of it. Like, people don't just point blank say like, oh, that doesn't work or oh, that's a light type of it. So T14 and all the technology that it, it showed was kind of like a leap, right? And so that, that's why they came up with Abram X and that type of thing. But Abram X, they're not doing it. Basically, they're doing this person, which I'm going to think that it's going to be closer to Abram X, if not completely, right? Uh, that's how it that's how it feels to me. And I've said that when I saw the Abram X video reactor, like, I'm sure America's going to get to it, even if they deny it right now, right? Because even potential T-14 
it's too much right like how does america doesn't have the best tank or like close to best tank type of shit right because uh, abrams is great but t14 all the technology displayed was like some next step right whether they have t14 there t14 is not in the production that's not the point right now so yeah abram x type of this is basically going to be abram x but like uh, more modified after like knowing how ukraine war is working Ukraine has highlighted a critical need for integrated protections for soldiers built from within instead of adding on. Take a look at the Army Science Board unclassified chart here. You can pause it if you want to read the full breakdown of the Abrams weight components, but I think the thing to pay attention to here is that 50% of the Abrams weight is its armor. 15 tons is dedicated to the turret structure. They can save a lot of weight there with new production techniques like 3D metal printed holes and computer assisted designs. Brigadier General Norman. See the thing, uh, one thing annoying like at his cars, the with the modern technology, with the you know 3D, you know really accurate material technology, people are creating this kind of like a, how do I say this a honeycomb style structure, with it where, where there is literal chunk missing in the structure, but they are like made in a way that it become it's rigid enough, like it's strong enough, right? Uh, it also has like a you know, shock absorbing type of property but it doesn't really break with real clever engineering and like clever you know alloys and things so i can see like tank following the same but the problem with the tank is car is supposed to be strong in one way but tank is supposed to like in, in any like if if the area that is hit that that is missing a part like that just you know just to lighten the weight it might be a problem i don't know they have to do real clear, clever engineering but i can see something like that being applied there that inside of the tank is like a honeycomb style thing right with small chunks missing in there but it just like creates enough thing that is like somewhat flexible so you can absorb a damage and it's also strong and said quote we are consistently looking at ways to drive down the made battle tanks weight to eatable in where we can go and how we can get there one of the lessons learned in ukraine is that tanks are sometimes dead meat if they're too heavy they get stuck in the mud they're too slow not nimble enough to fire and then escape from drones that are searching for them becomes impossible heavy tanks also limit the amount of locations that you can attack from this makes your movement i think the general's quote is coming from is from the army science board study i put the link in the description if you want to follow along barney style but what you're looking at right now is the border between latvia and lithuania again this is a terrain analysis performed by U.S. Army engineers of the Abrams mobility over wet and dry terrain. The first image shows us the dry season. Everything in green that you're looking at right now is where Abrams can move unrestricted. The second image, though, shows us the wet season. Now, everything that you're looking at in red shows us where the Abrams movement would be restricted, where they couldn't move at all or below 16 kilometers per hour. Unless you're colorblind, you can see mostly everything is in red here. The study points out that this means, from a tactical perspective, a defending force could easily mine trafficable routes, destroy bridges, to complicate Abrams' combat operations during the wet season and funnel them into choke points. Yeah, you need to understand one thing that uh, t basically, you know, tank tracks and things are great at like muddy and like uneven field, but if it's like a big bump here and there, like massive potholes and things, those tracks could be problematic, right? There's a pros and cons to everything. So if you're like really badly battered uh, field and like just, you know, situation like this, yeah, that would be a problem. That's one of the reasons why you see uh, old Soviet and Russian things like uh, some infantry vehicle, this and that has like big ass tires rather than tracks. Because the area they're supposed to go is basically like that, which is like basically an off-road vehicle at that point. It's like Range Rover tank at some type of shit. The reason for this has to do with the ground pressure of the tanks. Because of this, the study recommends new band tracks to lower the ground pressure to help fix that problem along with the lighter weight. You might think, okay, yeah, but it's a tank that's supposed to be heavy. But there are increasing costs to fielding a tank as it gets heavier. For one, heavier weight reduces fuel economy. By the time the SEP V3 rolled around, the operational range had dropped from 300 miles down to 264 miles. That means the Abrams burns between 1.5 and 3 gallons per mile. You heard me right, gallons per mile, not miles per gallon. The tank was originally invented to clear a way for the infantry in the teeth of so the just like the Hummer. Fire. Now it is the infantry who will have to clear a way for the tanks. Churchill's quote is as true then as it is today. 
Here's how trusty FM3-0 explains the role of the M1E3 tank. This is an actual quote. FM3-0, it's like the US Army Operations Combat Bible, but they say infantry protects tanks from enemy infantry and anti-tank systems, while tanks provide mobile protected firepower for the infantry. Ground maneuver can make enemy forces displace and become vulnerable to joint fires, while joint fires can disrupt enemy reserves and command and control to enable operations on the ground. General Norman, I follow you on X. If you're open to signing my copy of FM3-0, you can message me on my X or Instagram, at Cappy Army, links in the description. The Army Science Board points out how much of a hidden pain it is to get the Abrams to the fight. It relies on limited number of British transport HETs, hats, which are like giant tractor trailers. All I know is I wouldn't want to be an E3 stuck ground guiding that thing in reverse, helping to park that. In fact, American Transportation Command, Transcom, issued a statement. Oh God, I remember playing that Euro Truck Simulator 2. First time, I'm like, what the fuck, this like whole trailer and truck reversing all that crap is insane. Now imagine that real life, but now military, add military to it, add tanks to it. That is some insane shit, like, <laughs> what is somebody mess up, like, that's ruined the whole thing, like, that is just, I don't know, man. That is why the first time I was like, okay, they put like Abrams there and like travel all the way, you know, like through three time zones on a rail. That must require like an insane amount of like uh, coordination, like multiple days or type of shit. That concluded, quote, the M1A2 SEP V3 cannot achieve transportable approval at this time. Meaning that Transcom isn't willing to go out of their way and say that they approve of this vehicle for transportation wide scale. Anyone who has served in an armored unit knows how vehicles need to be towed often and then be recovered, even if they just break down. So it would take two M88 recovery vehicles to tow a SEP V3. The study found that the mean time between failures for the current Abrams was approximately 200 miles, which poses problems for extended operations. All of this is to say, we needed a redesign to solve these growing problems. So the M1A3 will be a combination of technologies from the cancelled SEP V4 and the Abrams X Pro. Yeah, take the cues from Saints Row and just like drop them from helicopters and shit. There you go. While some American music is playing in the background. That's the most American shit ever. Prototype. It'll likely have the hybrid electric drivetrain that reduces fuel consumption by 50%, making it like the Prius of tanks. The hybrid power pack of the Abrams X which may be incorporated into the M1A3, and it looks promising. With its greater efficiency, this could help reduce the signature of the tank to make it more stealthy. Its silent watch capabilities would be a huge plus, allowing you to monitor the battlefield without drawing attention to your location. General Norman confirmed active protection is a requirement. Basically, do you remember the, uh, the game IGI? I don't know if you're old enough to write. I remember playing that game very early on, way too long, I don't know, like, uh, 15 plus, I don't know how long before, like, yeah, 15 plus years ago or something. Yeah, easily, right? I remember playing that game, like, long before. So, could be 15 or 17, I was like 10 or 12, some shit, I don't know. I still remember hearing that tank sound, that tank rail sound, and just panicking. Because that game captured tank so insanely. It was panic worthy every time you see tank rolling on in animation. Now imagine the same shit, but you don't hear the tank. You're walking around and slowly look at the behind a tank barrel is literally pointing towards you. There you go. That's what they're trying to achieve. Stealthy tank. Why the fuck not? For the M1A3, saying, quote, that's part and parcel to the vehicle survivability, profile, and design. That's one of the things that we know absolutely we will integrate into the program. Recent experience in the Israeli-Hamas conflict shows that the trophy system isn't the greatest at tackling cheap and plentiful drone drop munitions or FPV attacks because current versions are limited to a 55 degree elevation. Trophy uses fairly large and powerful projectiles to counter threats too, which is less than ideal against swarms of drones that might attack a vehicle multiple times in a short time span. It's not only overkill, but it limits the number of charges the system can carry. My belief based on reading these documents and listening to interviews with- <laughs> It makes sense. Using that kind of technology for one Amazon drone is insane. What if they're like a thousand Amazon drone? They could throw thousands of Amazon drone every few hours or some shit. Limitless power, just to, you know, like drop a bomb or like, you know, IED or some shit, whatever, to that drone and just like, you know, like from your smartphone control it. That's insane. 
the people who like invented these small drones that anybody can carry they probably had no idea what kind of effect that would have on actual warfare that's insane the key army leadership about the abrams tank is that the future of armored warfare in the army the way the army envisions it is that they'll be preparing for a major change to tank tactics unlike anything we've seen since the introduction of the Abrams in 1980. Warrior Maven interviewed William Nelson, Deputy Commander, Army Futures Command, and he says that this running theme that I've seen throughout all these talks where he says they all seem to believe that the future will be a combination of manned and unmanned platforms that are integrated with aerial UAVs. The M1A3 is the first step in that direction. The Army plans to adopt and start fielding the eventual M1A3 by the early 2030s. While defense acquisition projects always run into cost overlays, overruns and delays, the fact that General Dynamics already did that much legwork on the Abrams X tech demonstrator might iron out some of the few road bumps along the way. So here's hoping we see a production version of the M1A3, which will what it'll be named after the M1E3, rolls off the assembly line, blasting through the enemy. Yeah, so E is just like, uh, just like a you know pre-stages name. Then it becomes an A3. Makes sense. So yeah, uh, yeah. So it's just completely insane. Like the technology that's like yeah, an unmanned thing. Yeah, that becoming like F-35 is already made like that. Like they're already invested America, so they're gonna go that route, right? The sixth generation uh, air dominance is also going to be like drones and things. Uh, I'm pretty sure like a lot of ships and like navy things are also pointing towards that. Like yeah. If you have like seamless integration to uh, man and unman thing, that can re really increase your power, right? With very few people, you can uh, generate a force that might be really high. Like, uh, you you know, you could just have like a hundred people acting like a five thousand people, like heavy, uh, you know, like machinery people type of element, right? Tanks, jets, God knows what. But it's just like hundred people controlling a lot of it, which is like uh, perfect in a way. Because, you know, the, the less people are at stake, less people are threatened, the better it works, right? You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to pull somebody out because it's a drone. Nobody's going to get hurt type of way. So it increases, like, a, a, you know, aggressive attack element of it. All right, well, that was America's new tank. is legitimately insane. New Abrams. Not completely like the old Abrams, but like the old Abrams, but it's, like, a different enough to be different, but it's still Abrams. There you go. Yeah, you, your father was an Abrams <laughs> guy. Your grandfather was Abrams guy and when you start you're gonna be in Abrams guy as well. There you go. Right? I'll see you next time.